We want to be faithful in serving you. We want to be faithful in worshiping you. We want to be faithful, God, with our lives and the way we present you, the way we present ourselves and who you are in our lives. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who stirs in each heart who believes in you and who has surrendered their lives to you. God, I pray this morning as we observe, observe the Lord's Supper, God, that we would in every way be mindful of the text that the Apostle Paul has written, that we would take this time to actually do some self-inspection. God, that we would understand that when we come before you, when we come before you, especially in communion, Father, that this is an intimate time as individuals, but also as a church body. And so, Father, I pray that we would honor you by being faithful. We would honor you through obedience, through following what you're leading us to do. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would touch each and every one of our hearts this morning, that we would know in a few short minutes, Lord, as we exit this, this church building, God, that we have met with you. We've not only sung, sung your, your praise songs and your hymns, and not that we've heard your word, but, Father, that we've, we've actually been moved by what you're trying to do in us. So, Father, I pray that we would give you our attention this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You know, I, I said as we were first starting that, you know, as Baptists, as Christians, and now let's just go, as human beings, change is not always in our wheelhouse of fun. Anybody really like to change tires? Change dirty diapers? No, no. Change is not always good. But change is really what we're designed for. God designed it for us to, to grow and to mature and, and change in, in our behavior, born out of our beliefs, born out of the word, born out of God's power. And so every, every moment that, that we're, we're breathing, the, God, uh, the breath that God has granted us, we're actually moving towards something, towards someone towards God and towards his completed plan in our lives and ultimately in the completed plans for his creation and to bring eternity on when Christ comes back. And that could be at any moment. And yet until he comes, he's given us some, some yatus. You ought to. I had a professor in seminary, and his name was Van Christensen, and he was by far my favorite because he always, he always took everything out of the box of what, what we were comfortable with. And he said, this is seminary, this is Christianity, this is Southern Baptist. He said, but if you live in, only live in this box, then you're getting less than 25% of what God had for you. He said, because in the boxes where you grow, in the churches where you grow, where you're discipled, where you worship, where you commune, where, where, where you, you kind of gather as a family, he said, but that family can only consume so much of, of what God's purpose and plan is for you. So you've got to allow God to, to bring you out of the box, to put you at a job where maybe there's non-believers or there's, there's believers that don't quite match your theology and your doctrine or put you in a, in a relationship that, that is, not, is not exactly what you had hoped or dreamed of. And yet you feel like God is leading you, God's placing you. And our want to is to, well, hold it. I don't like this. And if I don't like it, it can't be right, right? Because God would never want me to be out of my comfort zone, right? Wrong. Exactly. So my seminary professor, he said, you need to coin a new, a new word. And he said, oughtness. He said, oughtness should be what defines you, that you do what you ought to do instead of what you think you should do, much less what you want to do. You need, you need to be, and God holds you accountable for what you ought to do. Because our minds can be deceived, our hearts can be broken, we can be exhausted and simply not be able to cope with the world. 
So the Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians is dealing with a church that is, is disgruntled, is going in separate directions. And if you've been listening or, or been in attendance and you've heard um, the sermon series through John chapter 17, you, you can't help but land on God desires unity through the power of the Holy Spirit for his body. For us to be as united as the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit is. That there's a unity that we can't manufacture. We can't manufacture a love for each other. But through the power of God, he brings that into our equation, into our, our abilities, and then he presses that into our, our, our oughtness. We ought to love each other. Because if we don't love each other, then we can't love God the way God wants to, to be loved and deserves to be loved. And so if you'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is, is coming off of some pretty harsh language to the Corinthian church because they, they've allowed their, their presuppositions and their want-tos and their likes and their desires to supplant what Paul had taught them. At the, in the very first words of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 11, let me get there. It's, it's 10, 11, and 12, right? It is. His first, and you guys aren't going to see this because this is verse 11 and I didn't, verse 1 and I didn't give it to it, give it to them. He said, be imitators of me just as I am of Christ. So that's how he be, he's going to begin this, this um, venture into, you guys do it this way, but it's the wrong way. You think it's the right way, so I'm going to do some correction. Verse, chapter 11 is the corrective verse in the very middle of, of, this, of this book to try to correct behavior, beliefs, so that attitudes and faith can be changed and corrected. So in verse 23 of this chapter, we venture into... The Lord's Supper, communion, breaking the bread, drinking the cup. And Paul wants them to get it right because they've been doing it wrong. See, the Lord's Supper back in the first century was we're going to all gather around as the body of Christ and we're going to have a party. We're going to eat. We're going to drink. We're going we're to socialize. We're going to have all these things. And it's gotten to the place where it's no longer God-focused it's man-focused. Some of you eat too much. Some of you drink too much. Some of you have nothing to eat, and the ones that do have something to eat aren't giving to those that don't. And he says, that just can't be. So when you gather together to honor the Lord and to honor the Lord through, through the observation and observance of the Lord's Supper, then this is what you do. In verse 23, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He begins with a very positive. This is, this is what you do and this is what you get. When you do it right, you bring glory to the Savior. You bring glory to the Father. When you do it correctly. And this is what I taught you, he said. This is what he begins with. This you learned from me. And so he's trying to correct bad behavior. I, I, do you guys know who Caesar Milan is? He's the dog whisperer. He's one of probably the most famous dog trainer in all the world. And he has, he has methods and modes that, that most people can't even get a grip on. He can go, 
and a dog will come be charging for it and it will just stop. Or he'll snap his finger and a dog is getting ready to bite some, someone and that dog will just stop. And Ray does it and that person loses a limb. <laughs> or you do it and they lose an eye. But he's got this ability to, to connect with, with canines. And, and I've watched several of, of his, his trainings and, and people are just in awe. And, and he always makes this statement. He said, it's not about the dog, it's about the owner. He said, as, as the owner goes, so the dog will go. So if your dog is biting you, it's because you don't know how to train your dog. And then a, a pit bull will come sauntering up to him, and he'll bare his teeth, and he'll just snap his fingers, and that dog will sit. It's not his dog, because he knows what it takes to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. That's what Paul is teaching us here, is if you want to have a deeper, fuller understanding of who God is, what Christ has done for you and what he offers you and what you're capable of, then you've got to watch the master. You got to know the master. You got to understand more fully than what you understand. And it can begin right here as we acknowledge his death his burial, and his resurrection. Because he says when you eat and when you drink, you do this to remember me, to remember what I did for you, that I gave up divinity. He never stopped being divinity. The Father was the authority in, in, in Jesus. That's how it was designed. Jesus was always God, but he only did, Scripture says, what the Father led him and told him to do. So he was always God, but he was always obedient. And so he, Jesus says, I did this. I came down. I became a flesh and blood. I became a baby that was born in a manger in Bethlehem. I was, I was led down a path that you call the Via Dolorosa. He said, and I couldn't even carry my cross. And so they got another guy, Simeon or Simon. And they put it on the back of this, this man. And they marched me to the place where that cross would be put in the ground with me on it. And they would mock me. And they would spit on me. And they, they would stab me. They would give me awful drink to drink just to to make me a mockery in front of the crowd. He said, and then I would breathe my last breath. And in that last breath, I would say it is finished. And then they would put me in a tomb, a borrowed tomb. And I would lay there for three days, fully dead, physically. And then on that third day, I would defeat all the enemies of God. I would rise from the dead. Satan would no longer have a hold. And then I would walk for 40 days, letting you guys hang with me, he would say. I'd share a meal with you. I'd cook for you. I call on you to do things that you simply could not do, and yet you did them. He said, that's, that's, that's who's running things. That's who's in charge. That's why you do what you do. See, Christianity is all about Jesus. If Jesus isn't, isn't Christianity, then, then we have nothing because he's the one that brings us to this place. And I, for one... Man, I want to know Jesus and the ways of God fuller. Because I get in my own head and I'm just a bonehead. And so are you. We get angry, we get anxious, we get upset, we, we, we get discouraged. And all of a sudden, things just don't look the same. And so then our behavior begins to change. Our thoughts begin to change. And then ultimately... If we don't go back to Christ, 
then our beliefs change. And our understandings change. And all of a sudden, we're not worshiping the God of the Bible, the Savior who gave his life for us, the God who, who gave us his word from Genesis through the last verse of Revelation. And so this is what Paul is trying to, cor to correct here. So in verse 27, he goes on and he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself and in doing so, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you asleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we wouldn't be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Now let me just highlight a, a word here in verse 32. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord. Now, now discipline, and, and I've said this previously, discipline in the minds of a lot of people is a bad word. It means pain. Discipline is not a bad word. Chastening is the pain, spanking, whooping. Some, discipline is designed to change behavior and to change belief so that when you're disciplined in something, a, a soldier is disciplined. They're taught in basic training to do certain things in certain ways so that when the rubber meets the road or, or crisis comes, they know exactly where to begin because they've been disciplined in what it means to be a soldier. That's, that's part of what he's saying here. That you are being disciplined. And part of being disciplined is changing behavior. Changing belief. And that's painful for me anyway. But it always is designed for better results. So listen to this verse again, if, um, verse 32. But when we are judged, which most of us would say that's a bad thing, right? Don't judge me. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know who my parents are. So judging from most humans' standpoint is a negative thing. We are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. In other words, he's going to discipline us so that we can learn to be his kids because we're already forgiven. We already have tasted what God has to offer us. And he says, you don't have to be and act like you don't know me. So he says, examine yourself. Verse 28, but a man ought to, ought to, must, but a man must examine himself, and in doing so, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. Self-examination, self-inspection. How often do we do that? I mean, you know, a mirror is a good place to start. I don't like full-length mirrors. I, I, like, I like the ones that just, just get this. But you know, if you really want to get a true picture of you, you stand in front of a full-length mirror. And you look at your face. And you look at your hands. You look at your chest and your waist and your feet and your toes. And here's what we do. Oh, no! How did I get here? Instead of, thank you, Lord, that I am here. God, take this broken vessel. Take this discouraged, excited, whatever your, your frame of mind might be. And God, 
Help me to see me as you see me. Not as I think I am. Because that's his ultimate desire, is for us to realize that we're complete in him. That's the word perfect in this connotation, is that we're, he's perfected us. Even though we're in the flesh, even though we're going to fall short of his glory, even though we're going to sin, he said, man, you are my kid. Don't you always want the best for your children? I could not imagine wishing that my son didn't have less than the best. Growing up, Diana and I, we, we supported Logan in everything that he did. He's our only son, our only child. Because we wanted the absolute best, and we wanted him to know that his mom and dad were there for him. Even when he was wrong, even when things didn't go the way we thought they should. Because see, that's what parents do. That's what family does. We have each other's backs. We support even when it's not deserved. Because the deserving doesn't come from us, it comes from him. And let's just go back to the beginning, and I do this every Sunday pretty much. Man, you got to love God, and you got to love other people. If you don't love other people, you got a problem. And if it's your own flesh and blood, there's something wrong with us. So that's where that self-examination can shine. Because we can't, we can't lie to God. I mean, we can utter lies to him. And I'm sure he's up there going, who does he think I am? What, I didn't just fall off the turnip truck. I, did, I wasn't just created. Man, I created everything. Don't be a fool. Don't be an idiot. Just be real. And that's what the examination allows us to do. It's to be real for us. See, I look in the mirror, and I, I mean, I, I rarely like what I see. Man, I got wrinkles. I, I mean, I'm old. I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> and God says, but I love you. I made you. I made you. So Paul says, examine yourselves. And in doing so, then, then, you're in the right place to worship God. And in this case, to partake of the Lord's Supper. At Monument Baptist, man, if you're a Christian, if you've professed Jesus as Lord, you're part of the family. You, please, as a brother and sister in Christ, partake of the Lord's Supper. There are some, some churches that, that say, no, you have to be a member. No, we're a member of God's family. We do have church membership. But you don't have to be a member to partake of the Lord's Supper. Because we're the, we're the body of Christ. We're the family of God. We're, we're brothers and sisters. I've got four brothers. Two stepbrothers used to have three. Got a lot of brothers. But I need more. I've got no sisters. I've got a, one sister-in-law. And God says, guess what? Open your eyes, Ray. You've got all kinds of family. you got some grandmas and grandpas. you got some moms and dads. Because we're all in this together. Now listen to what else he says. Verse 29, because this is when it begins to get tough. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Do, do you see what, what God has done? God is saying, I will not force you to do anything but I will give you every opportunity to do what's right. Paul is the vessel that is writing and is speaking. You have responsibility, mirror, for that person you're looking at. Diana can only do so much for Ray, but I'm accountable to that person in the mirror, just as you are. 
So the Bible says, judge yourselves rightly. And all, truthfully, all will be well. The rains are still going to come. The floods are going to come. Winter's going to come. Pain's going to come. Death is going to come. All, all, all of real life is going to come. But all is well. Because if all is well with God, then all is well, period. Because we can't be circumstantial Christians. He's either God all the time or he's not God. And he's always. Let me finish this up. Verse 30, for this is the reason many of you have a lot of problems. Some of you are weak. Some of you are sick. Some of you sleep. I, I know we like to discount this, but we can't. When we're not in step with God, life isn't what it should be for us. It's not what it could be. And, and so here's what God does. We get out of step. Here's that narrow road, and, and we're, we're walking down that road, and we decide we want to take a detour down this path. And so God, being God, he lets us go. And we begin to, to do what we want to do. And here's God. Come home. Come home. I've allowed this in your life. Will you look at me? Will you listen to me? Come home. Now, now this is happening in your life. And God's sovereignly in control of everything. Will you come home? Will you come home? Will, will you bend the knee to me again? Will you profess your love for me, your commitment to me? Because as long as we're over here, God will spend the rest of our lives drawing us to himself. And then we've missed all the glorious things God has for us. But he says, you, you, you have to make the choice. Because he's already paved the way. Verse 31, but if we judged ourselves rightly, there's no place for judgment. We would not be judged. One of my pet peeves before we go into this is, is people that make life too hard. Sometimes I look in the mirror and I say, Ray, you're the problem. You're making life way, way too hard. Anybody procrastinate? Ah, uh, see, now, you, n notice the, pro the procrastinators are not procrastinating in saying, yes, it's me. So we're really not procrastinators. <laughs> we are. Uh, any of you doubters? Fearful? Yeah. We've all got issues. And this is the moment as Evelyn's going to come to the piano and Evelyn's just going to play some soft songs. I'm going to ask you if you'll quiet your heart. Bow your heads if you want to. I just want to take a short time of, of allowing us where we're sitting and standing to let God speak to us. He's an intimate, personal God. And he loves you. And he says, come to me, all who are weary, and I'll give you rest. I'll take that burden from you. Stop carrying what doesn't belong to you. Because if we carry what doesn't belong to us and we keep adding things that, that shouldn't be added and, and the load gets heavier and heavier and eventually will collapse. And he says, you don't have to. He said, I will carry you because that's what I do. Because I'm with you. I will never, I, I will never desert you. But don't walk away from me either. Father, this morning, Lord, we've read part of the 11th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, a letter to, to people that, that are like us. They're, they're family. They're all dead and gone. But they're your kids, just like we are. 
and they had problems that none of us, most of us can't even begin to, to fathom. And yet, Lord, you made the same offer to them as you're making to us this morning. God, soften our hearts. God, speak truth into our lives. Father, this is your house. We are your people. God, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper this morning. And Lord, may we do so having met with you giving you the opportunity and for us to recognize just how faithful and loving you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the deacons if they'll come forward. Again, if you're our guest this morning and you're a believer, please join us. We'll all go on this adventure together. This is new to us. This is not new to God. John, would you ask the Lord to bless the bread? Lord, we just come this time of service, Lord, as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Lord, we just lift up these liniments of your body, Lord, that you gave for our salvation Lord, on the cross. You rose the third day, Lord. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, when you eat the bread, you eat it in remembrance of me. He said in the same manner, he said there's a tab on your little cup that you pull up towards you as it's facing away from you. And in all seriousness, he said, when you drink this cup, you do this in remembrance of me.
you can just set that on your chair or something. And I will say that uh, we will make changes in our, our quality bread. He's everything. You know that? There's a time for reverence. There's a time for, for laughter. There's a time of, of celebration. We're going to sing a song. It's called Jesus Lord to Me. We sing it almost every single Sunday. We've probably done it for the last 15 years. And it simply states that he is, he is, he's everything to us. He is Lord to me. So let's sing that. Thank you for being here this morning. You could have chosen to go anywhere or stay home and watch it online or not watch anything. Thank you for being here this morning. I don't believe in accidents, not when it comes to God or coincidences. So he invited us all to come this morning and we showed up. Thank you for being here. Go out this week. Guys, if you want to come have coffee, freshly ground coffee, it's top of the line. Eight o'clock in the morning, we'll have a time of prayer and coffee. Just pray for each other this week. Matter of fact, do me a favor. Just swivel and lock eyes with someone. And uh, say, you know, you might even tell them as you're walking, I'm going to pray for you this week. I'm going to pray all that goes well. And if it really tanks, I'm still praying for you. I didn't do this. I'm just praying for you. Okay? So pray for each other. Send, send a card. Send an email. Send a message. Pick up the telephone. And we don't have the rotaries anymore, but do, 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 do. Stay in touch. All right? Have a wonderful week. Thank you for being here. And the Lord bless you. Have a great day.